Section 8 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 1, The Gold Bug, Part 1. Epigraph. What ho, what ho, this fellow is dancing mad. He hath been bitten by the tarantula. All in the wrong. Many years ago, I contracted an intimacy with a Mr. William Legrand. He was of an ancient Huguenot family, and had once been wealthy, but a series of misfortunes had reduced him to want. To avoid the mortification consequent upon his disasters, he left New Orleans, the city of his forefathers, and took up his residence at Sullivan's Island, near Charleston, South Carolina. This island is a very singular one. It consists of little else than the sea sand, and is about three miles long. Its breadth at no point exceeds a quarter of a mile. It is separated from the mainland by a scarcely perceptible creek oozing its way through a wilderness of reeds and slime, a favorite resort of the marsh hen. The vegetation, as might be supposed, is scant or at least dwarfish. No trees of any magnitude are to be seen. Near the western extremity, where Fort Moultrie stands, and where are some miserable frame buildings, tenanted during summer by the fugitives from Charleston dust and fever, may be found indeed the bristly palmetto, but the whole island, with the exception of this western point, and a line of hard white beach on the sea coast, is covered by a dense undergrowth of the sweet myrtle, so much prized by the horticulturists of England. The shrub here often attains the height of fifteen or twenty feet, and forms an almost impenetrable coppice, burthening the air with its fragrance. In the inmost recesses of this coppice, not far from the eastern or more remote end of the island, Legrand had built himself a small hut, which he occupied when I first, by mere accident, made his acquaintance. This soon ripened into friendship, for there was much in the recluse to excite interest and esteem. I found him well educated, with unusual powers of mind, but infected with misanthropy and subject to perverse moods of alternate enthusiasm and melancholy. He had with him many books, but rarely employed them. His chief amusements were gunning and fishing, or sauntering along the beach and through the myrtles in quest of shells or entomological specimens. His collection of the latter might have been envied by a Sfamadam. In these excursions he was usually accompanied by an old negro, called Jupiter, who had been manumitted before the reverses of the family, but who could be induced neither by threats nor by promises to abandon what he considered his right of attendance upon the footsteps of his young Massa Will. It is not improbable that the relatives of Legrand, conceiving him to be somewhat unsettled in intellect, had contrived to instill this obstinacy into Jupiter with a view to the supervision and guardianship of the wanderer. The winters in the latitude of Sullivan's Island are seldom very severe, and in the fall of the year it is a rare event indeed when a fire is considered necessary. About the middle of October, 18-, there occurred, however, a day of remarkable chilliness. Just before sunset I scrambled my way through the evergreens to the hut of my friend, whom I had not visited for several weeks, my residence being at that time in Charleston, a distance of nine miles from the island, while the facilities of passage and repassage were very far behind those of the present day. Upon reaching the hut I rapped, as was my custom, and getting no reply sought for the key where I knew it was secreted, unlocked the door, and went in. A fine fire was blazing upon the hearth. It was a novelty and by no means an ungrateful one. I threw off an overcoat, took an armchair by the crackling logs, and awaited patiently the arrival of my hosts. Soon after dark they arrived, and gave me a most cordial welcome. Jupiter, grinning from ear to ear, bustled about to prepare some marsh hens for supper. Legrand was in one of his fits, how else shall I term them, of enthusiasm. He had found an unknown bivalve forming a new genus, and more than this he had hunted down and secured, with Jupiter's assistance, a scarabaeus, which he believed to be totally new, but in respect to which he wished to have my opinion on the morrow. And why not tonight? I asked, rubbing my hands over the blaze and wishing the whole tribe of Scarabii at the devil. Ah, if I had only known you were here, said Legrand, but it's so long since I saw you, and how could I foresee that you would pay me a visit this very night of all others? As I was coming home, I met Lieutenant G from the fort, and very foolishly I lent him the bug, so it would be impossible for you to see it until the morning. Stay here tonight, and I will send Jop down for it at sunrise. It is the loveliest thing in creation. What? Sunrise? 
Nonsense! No, the bug! It is of a brilliant gold color, about the size of a large hickory nut, with two jet-black spots near one extremity of the back, and another somewhat longer at the other. The antennae are— There ain't no tin in him, Master Will, I keep telling on you, here interrupted Jupiter. The bug is a ghoul bug, solid ever bit of him inside and all sep him wing. Never feel half so heavy a bug in my life. "'Well, suppose it is, Jupp,' replied Legrand, somewhat more earnestly, it seemed to me, than the case demanded. "'Is that any reason for your letting the birds burn?' "'The color here he turned to me, is really almost enough to warrant Jupiter's idea. You never saw a more brilliant metallic luster than the scales emit, but of this you cannot judge till tomorrow. In the meantime, I can give you some idea of the shape.' Saying this, he seated himself at a small table, on which were a pen and ink, but no paper. He looked for some in a drawer, but found none. "'Never mind,' said he at length. "'This will answer,' and he drew from his waistcoat pocket a scrap of what I took to be very dirty fool's cap, and made upon it a rough drawing with the pin. While he did this, I retained my seat by the fire, for I was still chilly. When the design was complete, he handed it to me without rising. As I received it, a loud growl was heard, succeeded by a scratching at the door. Jupiter opened it, and a large Newfoundland, belonging to Legrand, rushed in, leaped upon my shoulders, and loaded me through with caresses, for I had shown him much attention during previous visits. When his gambols were over, I looked at the paper, and, to speak the truth, found myself not a little puzzled at what my friend had depicted. "'Well,' I said, after contemplating it for some minutes, "'this is a strange scarabaeus, I must confess. New to me, never saw anything like it before.' unless it was a skull or a death's head, which it more nearly resembles than anything else that has come under my observation. "'A death's head?' echoed Legrand. "'Oh, yes. Well, it has something of that appearance upon paper, no doubt. The two upper black spots look like eyes, eh? And the longer one at the bottom like a mouth. And then the shape of the whole is oval.' "'Perhaps so,' said I. "'But, Legrand, I fear you are no artist.' I must wait until I see the beetle itself, if I am to form any idea of its personal appearance. "'Well, I don't know,' said he, a little rattled. "'I draw tolerably, should do it at least, have had good masters, and flatter myself that I am not quite a blockhead.' "'But, my dear fellow, you are joking, then,' said I. "'This is a very passable skull. Indeed, I may say that it is a very excellent skull, according to the vulgar notions about such specimens of physiology.' "'And your scarabaeus must be the queerest scarabaeus in the world, if it resembles it. "'Why, we may get up a very thrilling bit of superstition upon this hint. "'I presume you will call the bug Scarabaeus Caput Hominis, or something of that kind. "'There are many similar titles in the natural histories. "'But where are the antennae you spoke of?' "'The antennae,' said Legrand, who seemed to be getting unaccountably warm upon the subject. "'I am sure you must see the antennae. I made them as distinct as they are in the original insect, and I presume that is sufficient. Well, well, I said, perhaps you have, still I don't see them, and I handed him the paper without additional remark, not wishing to ruffle his temper. But I was much surprised at the turn affairs had taken. His ill humor puzzled me, and as for the drawing of the beetle, there were positively no antennae visible, and the whole did bear a very close resemblance to the ordinary cuts of a death's head. He received the paper very peevishly, and was about to crumple it, apparently to throw it in the fire, when a casual glance at the design seemed suddenly to rivet his attention. In an instant his face grew violently red, and another as excessively pale. For some minutes he continued to scrutinize the drawing minutely where he sat. At length he arose, took a candle from the table, and proceeded to seat himself upon a sea-chest in the farthest corner of the room. Here again he made an anxious examination of the paper, turning it in all directions. He said nothing, however, and his conduct greatly astonished me. Yet I thought it prudent not to exacerbate the growing moodiness of his temper by any comment. Presently he took from his coat pocket a wallet, placed the paper carefully in it, and deposited both in a writing desk, which he locked. He now grew more composed in his demeanor, but his original air of enthusiasm had quite disappeared. Yet he seemed not so much sulky as abstracted. As the evening wore away, he became more and more absorbed in reverie, from which no sallies of mine could arouse him. It had been my intention to pass the night at the hut, as I had frequently done before, but seeing my host in this mood, I deemed it proper to take leave. 
He did not press me to remain, but as I departed he shook my hand with even more than his usual cordiality. It was about a month after this, and during the interval I had seen nothing of Legrand, when I received a visit to Charleston from his man, Jupiter. I had never seen the good old negro look so dispirited, and I feared that some serious disaster had befallen my friend. "'Well, Jup,' said I, "'what is the matter now? How is your master?' "'Why, to speak the truth, massa, him not so very well as mought be.' "'Not well? I am truly sorry to hear it. What does he complain of?' Ah, that's it. Him never plain of nothing but him very sick for all that. Very sick, Jupiter? Why didn't you say so at once? Is he confined to bed? No, that he ain't. He ain't fine no while. That's just where the shoe pinch. My mind has got to be very heavy about poor Master Will. Jupiter, I should like to understand what it is you are talking about. You say your master is sick. Hasn't he told you what ails him? Why, Master, tain't worth while for to get mad about the matter. Massa Will say nothing at all ain't the matter with him, but then what make him go about looking this here way with he head down and he shoulders up and as white as a ghost, and then he keep a siphon all the time. Keeps a what, Jupiter? Keeps a siphon with the figures on the slate, the queerest figures I ever did see. I's getting to be scared, I tell you. Hab for to keep mighty tight eye upon him noovers. T'other day he give me the slip for the sun up and was gone the whole of the blessed day. I had a big stick ready cut for to give him deuced good beatin' when he did come, but I was such a fool that I hadn't a heart out of all. He looked so very poorly. Eh, what? Ah, oh, yes. Upon the whole, I think you had better not be too severe with the poor fellow. Don't flog him, Jupiter. He can't very well stand it. But can you form no idea of what has occasioned this illness, or rather this change of conduct? Has anything unpleasant happened since I saw you? No, master, there ain't been nothing unpleasant since then. "'Twas for den, I'm feared. "'Twas the very day you was there. "'How? What do you mean? "'Why, massa, I mean the bug. "'There now. "'The what? "'The bug. "'I'm very certain that Master Will "'been bit somewhere about the head "'by that goo bug. "'And what cause have you, Jupiter, "'for such a supposition? "'Claws enough, massa, and mouth too. "'I never did see sick a deuce bug. "'He kick and he bite everything would come near him. Master Will caught him first, but had for to let him go again, mighty quick, I tell you. Then was the time he must have got the bite. I didn't like the look of the bug mouth myself, no how, so I wouldn't take a hold of him with my finger. But I caught him with a piece of paper that I found. I wrapped him up in the paper and stuffed piece of it in him out. That was the way. And you think, then, that your master was really bitten by the beetle, and that the bite made him sick? I don't think nothing about it. I knows it. What make him dream about the ghoul so much if it ain't cause he been bit by the ghoul bug? I's heard about them ghoul bugs for this. But how do you know he dreams about gold? How I know? Why, cause he talk about it in his sleep. That's how I knows. Why, Jup, perhaps you are right, but to what fortunate circumstance am I to attribute the honor of a visit from you today? What the matter, master? Did you bring any message from Mr. Legrand? No, master, I bring this here pistol. And here Jupiter handed me a note which ran thus. My dear Blank, why have I not seen you for so long a time? I hope you have not been so foolish as to take offense at any little brusquerie of mine, but no, that is improbable. Since I saw you, I have had a great cause for anxiety. I have something to tell you, yet scarcely know how to tell it, or whether I should tell it at all. I have not been quite well for some days past, and poor old Jupp annoys me almost beyond endurance by his well-meant attentions. Would you believe it? He had prepared a huge stick the other day with which to chastise me for giving him the slip and spinning the day solace among the hills on the mainland. I verily believe that my ill looks alone saved me a flogging. I have made no addition to my cabinet since we met. If you can in any way make it convenient, come over with Jupiter. Do come. I wish to see you tonight upon business of importance. I assure you that this is of the highest importance. Ever yours, William Legrand. There was something in the tone of this note which gave me great uneasiness. Its whole style differed materially from that of Legrand. What could he be dreaming of? What new crotchet possessed his excitable brain? What business of the highest importance could he possibly have to transact? 
Jupiter's account of him boded no good. I dreaded lest the continued pressure of misfortune had at length fairly unsettled the reason of my friend. Without a moment's hesitation, therefore, I prepared to accompany the negro. Upon reaching the wharf, I noticed a scythe and three spades, all apparently new, lying in the bottom of the boat in which we were to embark. "'What is the meaning of all this, Jup? I inquired. "'Him scythe, massa, and spade.' "'Very true, but what are they doing here?' "'Him de scythe and de spade what massa will sisp on my bind for him into town, and the devil's own lot of money I had to give for him. "'But what in the name of all that is mysterious is your massa will going to do with scythes and spades? "'That's more than I know, and devil take me if I don't believe tis more than he know too. "'And it's all come a de bug.' Finding that no satisfaction was to be obtained of Jupiter, whose whole intellect seemed to be absorbed by de bug, I now stepped into the boat and made sail. With a fair and strong breeze we soon ran into the little cove to the northward of Fort Moultrie, and a walk of some two miles brought us to the hut. It was about three in the afternoon when we arrived. Legrand had been awaiting us in eager expectation. He grasped my hand with a nervous expressment which alarmed me and strengthened the suspicions already entertained. His countenance was pale even to ghastliness, and his deep-set eyes glared with unnatural luster. After some inquiries respecting his health, I asked him, not knowing what better to say, if he had yet obtained the scarabaeus from Lieutenant G. "'Oh, yes,' he replied, coloring violently. "'I got it from him the next morning. Nothing should tempt me to part with that scarabaeus. "'Do you know that Jupiter is quite right about it?' "'In what way?' I asked, with a sad foreboding at heart. "'In supposing it to be a bug of real gold,' he said, with an air of profound seriousness, and I felt inexpressibly shocked. "'This bug is to make my fortune,' he continued, with a triumphant smile, "'to reinstate me in my family possessions. "'Is it any wonder, then, that I prize it?' Since fortune has thought fit to bestow it upon me, I have only to use it properly, and I shall arrive at the gold of which it is the index. Jupiter, bring me that scarabaeus. What? The bug, massa? I'd rather not go for the trouble that bug. You must get him for your own self. Hereupon, Legrand arose with a grave and stately air, and brought me the beetle from a glass case in which it was enclosed. It was a beautiful scarabaeus, and at the time unknown to naturalists. Of course a great prize in a scientific point of view. There were two round black spots near one extremity of the back, and a long one near the other. The scales were exceedingly hard and glossy, with all the appearance of burnished gold. The weight of the insect was very remarkable, and taking all things into consideration, I could hardly blame Jupiter for his opinion respecting it. But what to make of Legrand's concordance with that opinion, I could not for the life of me tell. "'I sent for you,' said he in a grandiloquent tone when I had completed my examination of the beetle, "'I sent for you that I might have your counsel and assistance in furthering the views of fate and of the bug.' "'My dear Legrand,' I cried, interrupting him, "'you are certainly unwell, and had better use some little precautions. You shall go to bed, and I will remain with you a few days until you get over this. You are feverish, and feel my pulse, said he. I felt it, and to say the truth, found not the slightest indication of fever. But you may be ill, and yet have no fever. Allow me this once to prescribe for you. In the first place, go to bed. In the next, you are mistaken, he interposed. I am as well as I can expect to be under the excitement which I suffer. If you really wish me well, you will relieve this excitement. And how is this to be done? Very easily. Jupiter and myself are going upon an expedition into the hills, upon the mainland, and in this expedition we shall need the aid of some person in whom we can confide. You are the only one we can trust. Whether we succeed or fail, the excitement which you now perceive in me will be equally allayed. I am anxious to oblige you in any way, I replied. "'But do you mean to say that this infernal beetle has any connection with your expedition into the hills?' "'It has.' "'Then, Legrand, I can become a party to no such absurd proceeding.' "'I am sorry, very sorry, for we shall have to try it by ourselves.' "'Try it by yourselves? The man is surely mad. But stay, how long do you propose to be absent?' 
probably all night. We shall start immediately and be back, at all events, by sunrise. And will you promise me, upon your honor, that when this freak of yours is over and the bug business, good God, settled to your satisfaction, you will then return home and follow my advice implicitly, as that of your physician? Yes, I promise. And now let us be off, for we have no time to lose. With a heavy heart I accompanied my friend. We started about four o'clock, Legrand, Jupiter, the dog, and myself. Jupiter had with him the scythe and spades, the whole of which he insisted upon carrying, more through fear it seemed to me of trusting either of the implements within reach of his master than from any excess of industry or complacence. His demeanor was dogged in the extreme, and dat deuce bug were the sole words which escaped his lips during the journey. For my own part, I had charge of a couple of dark lanterns, while Legrand contented himself with a scarabaeus, which he carried attached to the end of a bit of whipcord, twirling it to and fro with the air of a conjurer as he went. When I observed this last plain evidence of my friend's aberration of mind, I could scarcely refrain from tears. I thought it best, however, to humor his fancy, at least for the present, or until I could adopt some more energetic measures with a chance of success. In the meantime I endeavored, but all in vain, to sound him in regard to the object of the expedition. Having succeeded in inducing me to accompany him, he seemed unwilling to hold conversation upon any topic of minor importance, and to all my questions vouchsafed no other reply than, We shall see. We crossed the creek at the head of the island by means of a skiff, and ascending the high grounds on the shore of the mainland, proceeded in a northwesterly direction, through a tract of country excessively wild and desolate, where no trace of a human footstep was to be seen. Legrand led the way with decision, pausing only for an instant here and there to consult what appeared to be certain landmarks of his own contrivance upon a former occasion. In this manner we journeyed for about two hours, and the sun was just setting when we entered a region infinitely more dreary than any yet seen. It was a species of tableland, near the summit of an almost inaccessible hill, densely wooded from base to pinnacle, and interspersed with huge crags that appeared to lie loosely upon the soil, and in many cases were prevented from precipitating themselves into the valleys below merely by the support of the trees against which they reclined. Deep ravines in various directions gave an air of still sterner solemnity to the scene. The natural platform to which we had clambered was thickly overgrown with brambles, through which we soon discovered that it would have been impossible to force our way but for the scythe, and Jupiter, by direction of his master, proceeded to clear for us a path to the foot of an enormously tall tulip-tree which stood with some eight or ten oaks upon the level, and far surpassed them all, and all other trees which I had then ever seen, in the beauty of its foliage and form, in the wide spread of its branches, and in the general majesty of its appearance. When we reached this tree, Legrand turned to Jupiter and asked him if he thought he could climb it. The old man seemed a little staggered by the question, and for some moments made no reply. At length he approached the huge trunk, walked slowly around it, and examined it with minute attention. When he had completed his scrutiny, he merely said, Yes, master, jump climb any tree, you ever see any life. Then up with you as soon as possible, for it will soon be too dark to see what we are about. How far must go up, master? inquired Jupiter. Get up the main trunk first, and then I will tell you which way to go, and here, stop, take this beetle with you. The bug, master Will, the gold bug cried the negro, drawing back in dismay. What for must talk the bug way up the tree? That if I do, if you are afraid, Jup, a great big negro like you, to take hold of a harmless little dead beetle, why you can carry it up by this string. But if you do not take it up with you in some way, I shall be under the necessity of breaking your head with this shovel. What the matter now, massa? said Jup, evidently shamed into compliance. Always won't for the raise fuss with old nigger. Was only fun in any how. Me feared the bug. What care I for the bug? Here he took cautiously hold of the extreme end of the string, and maintaining the insect as far from his person as circumstances would permit, prepared to ascend the tree. In youth, the tulip tree, or Liridendrum tulipferum, 
the most magnificent of American foresters, has a trunk peculiarly smooth, and often rises to a great height without lateral branches. But in its riper age the bark becomes gnarled and uneven, while many short limbs make their appearance on the stem. Thus the difficulty of ascension, in the present case, lay more in semblance than in reality, embracing the huge cylinder as closely as possible with his arms and knees, seizing with his hands some projections, and resting his naked toes upon others, Jupiter, after one or two narrow escapes from falling, at length wriggled himself into the first great fork, and seemed to consider the whole business as virtually accomplished. The risk of the achievement was, in fact, now over, although the climber was some sixty or seventy feet from the ground. "'Which way must go now, Massa Will?' he asked. "'Keep up the largest branch, the one on this side,' said Legrand. The negro obeyed him promptly, and apparently with but little trouble, ascending higher and higher until no glimpse of his squat figure could be obtained through the dense foliage which enveloped it. Presently his voice was heard in a sort of halloo. "'How much further is Gulf will go?' "'How high up are you?' asked Legrand. "'Ever so fur,' replied the negro. "'Can see the sky from the top of the tree.' "'Never mind the sky, but attend to what I say. "'Look down the trunk and count the limbs below you on this side. "'How many limbs have you passed? One, two, three, four, five. "'I done fast five big limbs, massa, upon this side. "'Then go one limb higher.' In a few minutes the voice was heard again, announcing that the seventh limb was attained. "'Now, Jup!' cried Legrand, evidently much excited. "'I want you to work your way out upon that limb as far as you can. If you see anything strange, let me know.' By this time, what little doubt I might have entertained of my poor friend's insanity was put finally at rest. I had no alternative but to conclude him stricken with lunacy, and I became seriously anxious about getting him home. While I was pondering upon what was best to be done, Jupiter's voice was again heard. "'Most feared for to venture upon this limb, bear far. "'Tis dead limb pretty much all the way.' "'Did you say it was a dead limb, Jupiter?' cried Legrand in a quavering voice. "'Yes, Master, him dead as the door-nail. "'Done up for certain. "'Done departed this here life.' "'What in the name of heaven shall I do?' asked Legrand, seemingly in the greatest distress. "'Do,' said I glad of an opportunity to impose a word. Why, come home and go to bed. Come now. That's a fine fellow. It's getting late, and besides, you remember your promise. Jupiter, cried he, without heeding me in the least. Do you hear me? Yes, Master Will, hear you ever so plain. Try the wood well, then, with your knife, and see if you think it very rotten. Him rotten, Master, sure enough, replied the negro in a few moments, but not so very rotten as malt be. Malt venture out lead away upon the limb by myself, that's true. "'By yourself? What do you mean?' "'Why, I mean the bug. Tis very heavy bug. Suppose I drop him down first, and then the limb won't break with just the weight of one nigger. "'You infernal scoundrel!' cried Legrand, apparently much relieved. "'What do you mean by telling me such nonsense as that? As sure as you drop that beetle, I'll break your neck. Look here, Jupiter, do you hear me?' "'Yes, massa. Needn't holler at poor nigger that style. "'Well, now listen. If you will venture out on the limb as far as you think safe—' and not let go the beetle. I'll make you a present of a silver dollar as soon as you get down. I'm gwine, Massa Will, deed I is, replied the negro very promptly. Most out to the end now. Out to the end? Here fairly screamed Legrand. Do you say you are out to the end of that limb? Soon be to the end, Massa. Oh, Lord Gollum Massey, what is this here upon the tree? Well, cried Legrand, highly delighted, what is it? Why, tain't nothing but a skull. Somebody been left him head up the tree, and the crows done gobble every bit of meat off. A skull, you say? Very well. How is it fastened to the limb? What holds it on? Sure enough, massa, must look. Why, this bare cursed circumstance, upon my word, there's a great big nail in the skull. What fastens a bit on to the tree? Well, now, Jupiter, do exactly as I tell you. Do you hear? Yes, massa. Pay attention, then. Find the left eye of the skull. Hum, who, dat's good. Why, there ain't no eye left at all. Curse your stupidity. Do you know your right hand from your left? Yes, I knows dat, knows all about dat. Tis my left hand what I chopped the wood with. To be sure, you are left-handed, and your left eye is on the same side as your left hand. Now, I suppose, you can find the left eye of the skull. 
or the place where the left eye has been. Have you found it? Here was a long pause. At length the negro asked, Is the left eye of the skull upon the same side as the left hand of the skull, too? Cause the skull ain't got not a bit of hand at all. Never mind. I got the left eye now. Here the left eye. What must do with it? Let the beetle drop through it as far as the string will reach, but be careful and not let go your hold of the string. All that done, Mas Will. Mighty easy ting for to put the bug through the hole. Look out for him there below. During this colloquy, no portion of Jupiter's person could be seen, but the beetle, which he had suffered to descend, was now visible at the end of the string, and glistened like a globe of burnished gold in the last rays of the setting sun, some of which still faintly illumined the eminence upon which we stood. The scarabaeus hung quite clear of any branches, and if allowed to fall, would have fallen at our feet. Legrand immediately took the scythe and cleared with it a circular space, three or four yards in diameter, just beneath the insect, and having accomplished this, ordered Jupiter to let go the string and come down from the tree. Driving a peg with great nicety into the ground, the precise spot where the beetle fell, my friend now produced from his pocket a tape measure. Fastening one end of this at that point of the trunk of the tree which was nearest the peg, he unrolled it till it reached the peg, and thence farther unrolled it in the direction already established by the two points of the tree and the peg, for the distance of fifty feet, Jupiter clearing away the brambles with the scythe. At the spot thus attained, a second peg was driven, and about this has a center, a rude circle about four feet in diameter, described. Taking now a spade himself and giving one to Jupiter and one to me, Legrand begged us to set about digging as quickly as possible. To speak the truth, I had no especial relish for such amusement at any time, and at that particular moment would most willingly have declined it, for the night was coming on, and I felt much fatigued with the exercise already taken. But I saw no mode of escape, and was fearful of disturbing my poor friend's equanimity by refusal. Could I have depended, indeed, upon Jupiter's aid, I would have had no hesitation in attempting to get the lunatic home by force but I was too well assured of the old negro's disposition to hope that he would assist me under any circumstances in a personal contest with his master. I made no doubt that the latter had been infected with some of the innumerable southern superstitions about money buried, and that his fantasy had received confirmation by the finding of the scarabaeus, or perhaps by Jupiter's obstinacy in maintaining it to be a bug of real gold. A mind disposed to lunacy would readily be led away by such suggestions, especially if chiming in with favorite preconceived ideas, and then I called to mind the poor fellow's speech about the beetle's being the index of his fortune. Upon the whole, I was sadly vexed and puzzled, but at length I concluded to make a virtue of necessity, to dig with a good will, and thus the sooner to convince the visionary by ocular demonstration of the fallacy of the opinions he entertained. The lanterns having been lit, we all fell to work with a zeal worthy of a more rational cause, and, as the glare fell upon our persons and implements, I could not help thinking how picturesque a group we composed, and how strange and suspicious our labors must have appeared to any interloper who, by chance, might have stumbled upon our whereabouts. We dug very steadily for two hours. Little was said, and our chief embarrassment lay in the yelpings of the dog, who took exceeding interest in our proceedings. He at length became so obstreperous that we grew fearful of his giving the alarm to some stragglers in the vicinity, or rather this was the apprehension of Legrand. For myself I should have rejoiced at any interruption which might have enabled me to get the wanderer home. The noise was at length very effectually silenced by Jupiter, who, getting out of the hole with a dogged air of deliberation, tied the brute's mouth up with one of his suspenders, and then returned with a grave chuckle to his task. When the time mentioned had expired, we had reached a depth of five feet, and yet no signs of any treasure became manifest. A general pause ensued, and I began to hope that the farce was at an end. Legrand, however, although evidently much disconcerted, wiped his brow thoughtfully and recommenced. We had excavated the entire circle of four feet diameter, and now we slightly enlarged the limit, and went to the farther depth of two feet. Still nothing appeared. The gold-seeker, whom I sincerely pitied, at length clamoured from the pit with the bitterest disappointment imprinted upon every feature, and proceeded slowly and reluctantly to put on his coat, which he had thrown off at the beginning of his labour. In the meantime I made no remark. Jupiter, at a signal from his master, began to gather up his tools. 
This done, and the dog having been unmuzzled, we turned in profound silence towards home. We had taken, perhaps, a dozen steps in this direction, when, with a loud oath, Legrand strode up to Jupiter and seized him by the collar. The astonished negro opened his eyes and mouth to the fullest extent, let fall the spades, and fell upon his knees. "'You scoundrel!' said Legrand, hissing out the syllables from beneath his clenched teeth. "'You infernal black villain! Speak, I tell you! Answer me this instant without prevarication! Which, which is your left eye?' "'Oh, my golly, Master Will! Ain't this here my left eye for certain?' roared at the terrified Jupiter, placing his hand upon his right organ of vision, and holding it there with a desperate pertinacity, as if in immediate dread of his master's attempt at a gouge. "'I thought so! I knew it! Hurrah!' vociferated Legrand, letting the negro go and executing a series of curvettes and caracoles, much to the astonishment of his valet, who, arising from his knees, looked mutely from his master to myself, and then from myself to his master." "'Come, we must go back,' said the latter. "'The game's not up yet,' and he again led the way to the tulip-tree. "'Jupiter,' said he, when he reached its foot, "'come here. Was the skull nailed to the limb with the face outwards, or with the face to the limb?' "'The face was out, master, so that the crows could get it to eyes good without any trouble.' "'Well, then, was it this eye or that through which you dropped the beetle?' Here Legrand touched each of Jupiter's eyes." "'Twas dis eye, massa, de lef eye, jis as I tell you.' And here it was his right eye that the negro indicated. "'That will do. Must try it again.' Here my friend, about whose madness I now saw or fancied that I saw certain indications of method, removed the peg which marked the spot where the beetle fell to a spot about three inches to the westward of its former position. Taking now the tape measure from the nearest point of the trunk to the peg as before, and continuing the extension in a straight line to the distance of fifty feet, a spot was indicated, removed by several yards from the point at which we had been digging. Around the new position a circle, somewhat larger than in the former instance, was now described, and we again set to work with the spades. I was dreadfully weary, but scarcely understanding what had occasioned the change in my thoughts, I felt no longer any great aversion from the labor imposed. I had become most unaccountably interested, nay, even excited. Perhaps there was something, amid all the extravagant demeanor of Legrand, some air of forethought or of deliberation which impressed me. I dug eagerly, and now and then caught myself actually looking with something that very much resembled expectation for the fancied treasure, the vision of which had demented my unfortunate companion. At a period when such vagaries of thought most fully possessed me, and when we had been at work perhaps an hour and a half, we were again interrupted by the violent howlings of the dog. His uneasiness in the first instance had been evidently but the result of playfulness or caprice, but he now assumed a bitter and serious tone. Upon Jupiter's again attempting to muzzle him, he made furious resistance, and leaping into the hole, tore up the mould frantically with his claws. In a few seconds he had uncovered a mass of human bones, forming two complete skeletons, intermingled with several buttons of metal and what appeared to be the dust of decayed woolen. One or two strokes of a spade upturned the blade of a large Spanish knife, and as we dug farther, three or four loose pieces of gold and silver coin came to light. At sight of these, the joy of Jupiter could scarcely be restrained, but the countenance of his master wore an air of extreme disappointment. He urged us, however, to continue our exertions, and the words were hardly uttered when I stumbled and fell forward, having caught the toe of my boot in a large ring of iron that lay half buried in the loose earth. End of the Gold Bug Part One. Recording by A L W P O E on May seventh, twenty eleven. A L W P O E dot com.